This is the TBS Evening News with the people and resources of the Cable News Network. Don Miller and Jim Wilkerson on the anchor desk. CNN Weather and Sports with Dallas Reigns and Fred Hickman. South Korean President Chun Doo Hwan met with President Reagan at the White House today. CNN Scott Barrett reports from Washington. With the pomp and formality of a standard diplomatic welcome on the South Lawn of the White House, Korean President Chun Doo Hwan came seeking assurances from President Reagan. Assurances that the 39,000 U.S. troops stationed in his country would remain as a deterrent. There are 650,000 troops on the northern side of the border, 500,000 troops to the south. Administration officials say that disparity needs to be rectified. So after the Oval Office meeting and after a luncheon in which there were the awkward moments created by the need for a translator, the two presidents emerged to announce mutual admiration and mutual support, and it was President Chun who announced he had received the assurances he had come for. President Reagan gave me firm assurances that the United States has no intention of withdrawing the American forces in Korea. Top Reagan officials claim those U.S. forces may even be augmented as a result of this state visit. From the White House, the entourage went on to the State Department for still more pomp and honor and a visit with Secretary of State Haig. The Korean president has his friends in Washington. Some went so far as to take out full-page ads in the Washington Post. Still more friends demonstrated in support of the Chun regime. This trip is in fact part of the Korean campaign trail. Chun hasn't been elected. He took power after Park Chung-hee was assassinated. And then he had his main opponent, Kim Dae-jung, jailed for sedition. On Capitol Hill, the Korean leader met with the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Chairman Charles Percy was asked if the Korean elections and the commutation of Kim's sentence from the death penalty to life imprisonment was just window dressing. We support every effort uh, to move uh, uh, Korea, which is a dynamic economy, which uh, fell back and lagged a little bit last year with uh, no growth or negative growth and a relatively high rate of inflation. We hope that they can stabilize their political situation just as they can stabilize uh, their uh, economic situation. But certainly President Chun has brought Korea, South Korea, through a very troubled period. President Chung's opponents demonstrated too. Amnesty International gives the president a poor human rights rating. But Reagan officials say if Amnesty International was allowed in North Korea, Kim Il-sung's rating would be much worse than Chung's. White House officials say, however, the president didn't discuss charges of human rights violations with a Korean leader, and it is suspected an administration report commissioned by the Carter administration on human rights in Korea has been deliberately held up for release by the Reagan administration so as not to embarrass the Korean president during his trip here. Scott Barrett, Cable News Network, Washington. Meanwhile, in Chicago, about 50 people staged a protest in opposition to the South Korean president. Those demonstrators in Chicago were concerned about the human rights issue in Korea. Now, Chun did discuss the civil rights issue with President Reagan today, although officials say they did not talk about the fate of Kim Dae-jung, Chung's political opponent, who had been sentenced to life in prison. The Chicago demonstrators paraded outside the Korean consulate in the Windy City. The Education Department scrapped a plan fostered by the Carter administration that would have forced public schools to teach non-English speaking students in their native language. The Reagan administration has essentially withdrawn support for the plan and reactions are mixed. Many school officials are pleased with the move, minorities are not. Tom Dickerson has a report on the reaction of school officials in Houston. The district director of the League of Latin American Citizens says the decision is a setback for the Hispanic community. I think it proves how insensitive the Reagan administration is to the Hispanic community in this country. Throwing out the bilingual guidelines just shows that, proves to us that our Hispanic students will not get the quality education that they deserve. However, the director of bilingual education for the Houston the School District says the change will have no effect on Houston's bilingual education programs in grades kindergarten through 12. It doesn't affect HISD. We will continue to provide programs as the Houston Plan for Bilingual Education specifies. Education Secretary Bell said the government intends to protect the rights of non-English speaking students, but will allow local school districts to decide the best way of educating them. Tom Dickerson, Eyewitness News. The Federal Election Commission says that Ronald Reagan's campaign made illegal expenditures totaling more than $200,000. Now, most of the questionable expenditures were made during the critical New Hampshire primary campaign. 
It was in New Hampshire, remember, that Reagan turned around the earlier momentum gained by George Bush. The election commission says that Reagan campaign took rooms and bought broadcast time in Massachusetts. That was really part of the New Hampshire effort. When accounting for the money, the campaign claimed the expenses were part of the Massachusetts effort. If that charge does hold up, the campaign will have to reimburse the federal government. Chrysler workers have voted to accept pay cuts as part of the company's bid for the additional $400 million in government loan guarantees. Chrysler's United Auto Workers accepted the cuts by a narrow margin. There is still a great deal of paperwork to be cleared before the Chrysler company and loan can be approved. Also today, General Motors reported that it lost more than $750 million in 1980, the worst showing in company history and the first year since 1921 the GM has not turned a profit. The loss compared with a profit of nearly $3 billion in 1979. However, in Washington, Postmaster General William Bolger says the United States Post Office only lost half as much money as it was expected to lose last year. Now, Bolger says he expects the agency to show a surplus next year after a spring rate hike. He also reported that his postal workers moved over 100 billion pieces of mail in 1979. That's a new record. The space shuttle is delayed again. A leak develops in the spacecraft's fuel tank. Details when the TBS Evening News continues. The maiden voyage of the manned space shuttle Columbia has been delayed once again, this time by at least three weeks. Charles Hoff has details in this report. This latest delay is because of problems with the insulation on the spacecraft's fuel tank. The Columbia's launch has already been delayed by more than two years, and now officials at the National Aeronautics and Space Administration say the manned space flight will be launched no earlier than April 5th. The latest problem was discovered following tests at Cape Canaveral when more than a half a million gallons of super-cold liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen were pumped into the spacecraft's external tank. The shuttle is the first U.S. spacecraft with external fuel tanks. The propellants for the shuttle's three main engines are carried in the tank, then jettisoned from the spacecraft after the fuel is exhausted, only eight minutes into the flight. When the tanks were filled with the super-cold propellants, cracks appeared in the foam insulation which covers those tanks, indicating that the hard, high-temperature insulator underneath the foam had separated from the tank's aluminum skin. A NASA official says it appears that workers may have waited too long between applying the glue and the insulator. The foam insulation is used to shield the tank from the heat of the sun as well as from the heat of the flight. The hydrogen must be kept at a temperature of more than minus 400 degrees Fahrenheit, the liquid oxygen at nearly 300 degrees below zero. Technicians will attempt to fix the insulation problem by erecting special scaffolds on the launching pad. If the insulation cannot be fixed on the pad, the entire spacecraft will have to be moved back to the hangar, adding two more weeks to the delay. Charles Hoff, Cable News Network. The American-owned Esso oil refinery in San Salvador has been the target of a leftist bomb attack on Monday. A group of young rebels shot their way into the compound. Two innocent passers-by were killed in that gunfire. Now, there was damage to some of the Esso buildings, but gasoline storage tanks in that area were not damaged. Reagan administration officials confirmed today that the U.S. ambassador to El Salvador, Robert White, has been fired. CNN's Mike Betcher, who's been covering the civil war in El Salvador, has this report on the ambassador. The El Salvador Robert White was assigned to as U.S. ambassador last year was a country on the brink of civil war. Thousands of Salvadorans had been killed in fighting between the right-wing military civilian junta and leftist guerrillas, and support for the left seemed to be growing to the point where the U.S.-backed Salvadoran government seemed in danger of falling. As U.S. Ambassador, White was openly critical of the Salvadoran military's human rights record and urged the government to institute reforms to head off popular support for the guerrillas. To achieve that aim, White played a major role in helping the Salvadoran junta shape its Agrarian Reform Act which redistributed El Salvador's largest coffee, sugar, and cotton plantations among the country's poorest peasants. White also called for the hunter to crack down on right-wing death squads that routinely executed political dissidents. In December, after four American missionaries were murdered in El Salvador, White was openly critical of the hunter's investigation into the killings, saying it was making no attempt to determine if government soldiers were responsible for the murders. 
The former ambassador's strong emphasis on human rights as a factor in U.S. Salvadoran relations angered many strong Republican conservatives in this country, like Senator Jesse Helms, the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Subcommittee on Latin American Affairs. White removal signals a new U.S. policy towards El Salvador, a Reagan policy that in its first week seems headed towards increased military aid to this troubled Central American country. Mike Betcher, Cable News Network. Well, have the Soviets been cheating on the Salt One Arms Control Treaty? There's no official comment on that, but Aviation Week and Space Technology Magazine reports that President Reagan is upset over at least 30 Soviet violations of that pact. In fact, the magazine says that President Reagan may ask for a special meeting of the commission which investigates alleged violations. Now, according to the report, the Soviets have deployed SS-19 missiles in violation of SALT-1 and also deployed too many missile submarines and reactivated an old ICBM launch site, among other things. But despite that report and the harsh words that have crossed the Atlantic from Washington to Moscow, there are some signs that the Cold War rhetoric may be easing up just a bit. CNN's Washington Bureau Manager Stuart Lurie has these observations. Question. Has the Reagan administration decided it's time to reopen the Cold War? Answer. The signs are unclear. Let's review the statements of the past few days. President Reagan and his Secretary of State Alexander Haig went to considerable effort last week to talk tough to the Soviets. At his press conference, Reagan said, The only morality they recognize is what will further their cause, meaning they reserve unto themselves the right to commit any crime, to lie, to cheat, in order to attain that. And that is moral, not immoral. And we operate on a different set of standards. I think when you do business with them, uh, even at a detente, you keep that in mind. Haig accused the Soviets of fomenting international terrorism. And I would suggest also that an additional subject related intimately to this in the conduct of Soviet activity in, in terms of training, funding, equipping, is international terrorism. The Soviets reacted predictably. Moscow newspapers lashed out at Reagan. The Soviet Foreign Ministry called in the American Charge d'Affaires in Moscow, presumably to complain and Tass charged Haig with political subversion and others in Washington with misrepresentation of the facts. This is turning out to be a diplomatic tennis match with both sides trying to serve aces and make a series of smashes. But now the State Department is softening its ground strokes. Acting spokesman William Dias was asked today if he would comment on the summoning of the Charge in Moscow. He answered, no, I'm not sure I can tell you anything about it. They did summon the charge in. They had some things that they wanted to say to him. I'll leave that up to the Soviets. If they want to say anything about it, we don't plan to. Then he was asked to comment on Tass's allegation. Would not dignify that with a comment. If you get the idea that the anti-Soviet talk is being toned down here in Washington, you're right. Administration spokesmen privately are saying that behind the scenes, conversations between Soviet and American officials continue as normal. This country is still interested in negotiating an arms limitation agreement with the Soviets, the officials say. So maybe we are not entering a new Cold War after all. Just as a couple of smashes do not a winning tennis match make, a few harsh exchanges do not a new Cold War make. I'm Stuart Lurie, Cable News Network Managing Editor in Washington. So that new relationship between the world's two superpowers continues to evolve. During World War II, the four-wheel drive Jeep was a GI legend. It was so popular that it made a comeback years later, but in the past decade it has caused American Motors plenty of trouble. The Detroit Free Press reports that AMC has paid more than $9 million in court settlements involving Jeep CJ model accidents since 1973, and at least 17 other lawsuits are pending, mostly because of the Jeep's higher center of gravity it rolls over more easily, yet reportedly does not provide adequate roll bar protection. AMC says there are 600,000 Jeeps on the, on the road, and they're designed differently, and drivers should not speed around corners. Well, more than 200,000 students are getting an unexpected vacation in Philadelphia as that city's school system is hit with another strike. We'll have the details on the TBS Evening News when we come back.
Philadelphia schools were shut down by a strike today, and Mayor William Green called for the resignation of the entire school board. Nearly a quarter of a million students are affected by the walkout of bus drivers, maintenance workers, engineers, and aides. The Philadelphia schools were closed by a strike earlier in the school year, and Mayor Green said he believed the system needed new leadership. Green has asked negotiators to resume talks as soon as possible and to keep negotiating until an agreement can be reached. The curfew has been expended, extended here in Atlanta. It's designed to help prevent the murders and abductions of more black children. In his address on the state of the city today, Mayor Maynard Jackson urged parents to watch their children more closely. CNN's Gloria Murray has the details. Mayor Maynard Jackson says in 1981, Atlanta must have an additional 160 police officers on the streets. He says there is concern for safety, even though crime is down, which he called ironic, in light of the 17 missing and murdered children's cases. Jackson called on all parents to be more responsible for their children, watch them closer than they've ever watched before. Our children must feel our love while learning and obeying the rules of safety. The city council hopes to force children to obey safety standards by imposing a more lengthy curfew. Instead of 9 to 6 a.m., the new curfew will be from 7 p.m. to 6 a.m. and during daylight saving time, 9 to 6. That ordinance was passed Monday afternoon. Failure to obey will mean a jail sentence or a fine of up to $500 for parents. Councilwoman Mary Davis believes the penalties are too steep. I'm concerned that the issue the curfew is designed to deal with, which is trying to improve uh, parents' control over their children at night, is not going to be addressed if you fill the jails with people who can't afford to pay fines. Most of the other council members disagreed. If all parents were responsible and real of the things that we've got going on in our city, we wouldn't need the curfew, period. And without the fine, there's no point in having the curfew because the people who are already irresponsible are going to continue to remain irresponsible. I think we've got to have it to make the curfew effective and valid. The ordinance will go into effect as soon as the Americans sign it. Those who are opposed say it won't help because the children were abducted in the daytime. Those who are for the new curfew say it will keep kids like these from being snatched at night. Gloria Murray, Cable News Network, Atlanta. The March issue of Penthouse Magazine was back on sale again today. Moral Majority Leader, the Reverend Jerry Falwell, had managed to temporarily suspend the sales of that magazine, but a federal judge refused to bring a permanent injunction, citing First Amendment freedoms of the press. Falwell tried to block distribution of the magazine because of an interview in the March issue with Falwell that he says was obtained deceitfully. The judge suggested that if Falwell wants to pursue the issue, he should sue the magazine for damages rather than try to prevent its distribution. A religious-backed coalition announced today that it will enlist 5,000 volunteers to monitor sex, violence, and profanity on television. CNN's Dan Brewster has details in this report from Washington. You're a home who said and did vulgar things. The Coalition for Better Television is made up of conservative groups intent on cleaning up what they view as immorality and violence on television. The coalition's chairman, Donald Wildman, did not reveal the names of the groups involved, saying only that they number about 200. Many are pro-life and pro-family, according to Wildman, but none could be broadly defined as liberal. Beginning in March, the coalition will monitor the three major networks for such things as skin scenes, implied sexual intercourse, and sexually suggestive comments. Three months later, a boycott will be organized against products that are advertised on programs which are deemed offensive. Instead of reason, restraint, and responsibility, the networks have rather displayed an arrogance and indifference rarely matched in the history of corporate America. Wildman is affiliated with the United Methodist Church and heads the National Federation for Decency, an interfaith movement also founded to monitor and react to television programming. Both the Federation for Decency and the New Coalition have received the backing of Reverend Jerry Falwell's moral majority. Wildman says his plan involves using some 4,000 monitors to determine which are the offending programs. He was asked how sex would be defined for purposes of the survey. If that uh, camera zoomed, on, uh, zoomed upon a, a girl so as to exploit her breast or her midsection or whatever, uh, I think most monitors would score that as a skin scene. We have two other categories. We have what we call sexual, implied sexual intercourse. Uh, 
And I think anyone who's watching television can basically figure that out if they've uh, uh, red-blooded American. And uh, then there's another category that are sexually suggestive comments. Representatives of the three major television networks describe the coalition's efforts as censorship. Critics of this coalition point out that people have always had the right to boycott products they disapproved of for whatever reason. What they object to is any group attempting to dictate which products to boycott under the guise of religion. The critics argue this is especially objectionable given the imprecise nature of the coalition's standards and monitoring techniques. Dan Brewster, Cable News Network, Washington. Well, that's one battle, and here's another tilt in the classroom that may eventually wend its weary way to the Supreme Court. A New Jersey Senate committee passed a bill today requiring teachers to schedule one minute of silence for student reflection and thought. The bill's sponsors said he thought that the quiet time would help reduce school violence and drug abuse. However, opponents say it's just another way to try to get prayers back into the classroom. So, we'll see. Don? In this country, Jim, artichokes, especially those from uh, Jerusalem, are considered to be no less than a delicacy. In France, however, the artichoke may be used to save gas. Science reporter Kevin Saunders has details in this report. The French are even more heavily dependent on imported oil than the United States. So in France, the national government is encouraging the development of a new and surprising petroleum additive. The French government has been sufficiently encouraged at the prospect of fuel savings to provide facilities for research into a distillate of the Jerusalem artichoke, a potato-like vegetable which, the French researchers say, can make a substantial contribution to fuel savings in the normal day-to-day -day running of cars and trucks. The researchers say that unlike many fuel additives, the Jerusalem artichoke distillate does not actually increase the mileage derived from the fuel, but it does substantially lower the cost of the fuel. The new composite fuel is made up of 89% of normal petroleum with a 10% additive of the Jerusalem artichoke distillate. The remaining 1% is a catalyst which is apparently crucial to the operation of the blended fuel, but at this point the details of the catalyst remain secret. The resulting new fuel has been tested by, among others, French racing drivers, and first reports suggest that the Jerusalem artichoke distillate results in an overall fuel savings of about 14%. Research is continuing. Kevin Sanders, Cable News Network, Science Report. Well, the one and only Ali comments on a major sports scandal. And we've got a very unusual Texas-type beauty pageant coming up when the TBS Evening News continues. Illegal aliens are a fact of urban life. They come from poverty-plagued countries and work the worst jobs for lower than minimum wages. Sometimes they're brutally mistreated in their lives as fugitives without rights. That uh, was the way of life for a group of illegal immigrants before they were caught by New York police. Correspondent Pat Dolan reports. The 40th Precinct Station House in the Bronx handcuffed illegal aliens being herded into immigration service vans. All but a few are from the Dominican Republic. Most have come in search of jobs, relatives, a better life. Police say they spent two days shut up in the back of this tractor trailer during the trip from the U.S.-Mexican border. The incident began at 6.30 this morning when someone phoned police to say that a tractor trailer was unloading people here on Caldwell Avenue. A patrol car pulled over the van, but the driver insisted that he was carrying a load of lettuce. He said he could not open the back of the van because his brother had the key in a fourth floor apartment of this building. As they entered the building, they heard what they, what they believed was five shots being fired at them. The officers retreated from the building, called for backup assistance. When the additional units arrived, they were able to get in the building, and they discovered approximately 85 illegal aliens. 33 aliens were found in two apartments. Another 52 were hiding in the truck outside. Police also recovered a 25 caliber automatic pistol and more than $10,000 in cash, apparently payment from the immigrants for their secret passage into the country. As the aliens emerged from a questioning session, Rafaela Cruz and Felix Vasquez Francisco were there, handing out candy and cigarettes. 
25 years ago, the couple came here legally from the Dominican Republic, and they know better than most why their countrymen are leaving. What are conditions like in your country? Not good. Not good because of the, the, the country is poor and the, no job. And care you have a job that's for a few dollars. That's not good for the support for the family and care the people we have to the family. Immigration officials charge the driver and the owner of the truck with smuggling the aliens in. Several agents said the only thing unusual about this case is that it happened in New York. Along the country's southwest border, it would have been just another illegal entry. Pat Dolan, Cable News Network, New York. Well, Fred Hickman got up this morning, saw a shadow, and decided there'll be, what, 26 more days of February. Something like that. You can ask Dallas about that. I don't know. But the big story in sports today comes from the world of boxing. Muhammad Ali, former heavyweight champion, was in New York today. The man who was once known as one who could go get it is playing this one close to the ropes. Just like other occupations, find crooks in banks, find crooks in government, don't hurt the government because Nixon was a crook, and don't hurt nobody else, Nixon will come make it better. Well, Ali has nothing to do with it, but there seems to be a major scandal afoot in boxing, and the sport, well, has frankly got big trouble today. The great four-card fight scheduled for February 23rd at Madison Square Garden may not happen. The two big ones, Thomas Hearns, is to meet Wilfred Benitez for the WBA welterweight championship. Jerry Cooney and Ken Norton, number one contenders in the WBC and WBA, are to fight a heavyweight championship. Problem is, there may be no purse money to win. Muhammad Ali Sports of Los Angeles, or MAPS for short, which is co-promoting the card, is being investigated by the FBI. Ali's only personal connection with the outfit is promotion via his name. Reportedly, none of his money is involved. But $21 million is allegedly missing from the Beverly Hills branch of the Wells Fargo Bank. So is bank officer Benjamin Lewis, also a director on the MAPS board. So is MAPS president Harold Smith. They haven't been seen for a week, and embezzlement is suspected. Now, that missing money is needed to put the big card on. There were meetings today in New York trying to find out a way to salvage at least the Hearns, Benitez, Norton, Cooney fights. Both reportedly have been asked to take smaller cuts. Both have refused. There are also rumors promoter Don King might want a piece of the action, but King is also being probed by the FBI for alleged ripoffs of fighters and other improprieties. Later in the day, Wells Fargo Bank filed a $21 million plus lawsuit against Maps Incorporated. Smith and his wife, Lewis and his wife, Sammy Marshall, a bank loan officer, and Modak Productions, promotion that is. But those people have to be found before they can be tried. So the bottom line is one of the best fight cards in years, one that's been anticipated now for months, may not even happen. And for the fighters, the fans, and for the game itself, that would be a real shame. It took a five-man sudden-death playoff to do it, but John Cook won the abbreviated Bing Crosby Pro-Am Golf Tournament today. The 1975 California State Amateur Champion edged Hale Irwin and three others for the $40,000-plus first prize. An 18-year-old, billed as the finest basketball prospect in the nation, has decided where he'll play his college ball, made an announcement today. His name is Patrick Ewing, a seven-foot prep star from Cambridge, Massachusetts. Leads a team which has become renowned for its undefeated record. Had narrowed his college choices to three before five finally deciding today on Georgetown University. He'll be playing for coach John Thompson there. Now Ewing might just well be college basketball's Herschel Walker as a freshman, but his high school coach Mike Jarvis sees beyond the next four years. I have a little bit of Walton in him, uh, a little bit of Jabbar in him, and a whole lot of Russell in him. Um, and he'll also have a lot of Patrick Ewing in him. In college basketball today, they're whooping it up at Charlottesville, where Virginia has taken over the number one spot uh, from that tie they had with Oregon State in the AP poll. They had been tied for a week now. In college action tonight, no Notre Dame, the number nine team in the nation, beat St. Mary's at South Bend 94-63. Number seven, Arizona State, playing Cal a little bit later. NBA still in the All-Star break. They pick it back up tomorrow. Our Atlanta Hawks will be in Philadelphia to play the 76ers. The NBA Player of the Week is forward Kenny Carr of Cleveland, the fourth-year man out of NC State, scored 44 points while pulling down 29 rebounds for the Cavs in two ball games last week. And in the National Hockey League, Hartford uh, lost to Quebec tonight at Quebec, final score 4-2. The LA Kings are all tied up with the New York Rangers, 2-2 in the third period. And Pittsburgh trailing Chicago 4-3, that a second period score. And Jim, today New York Yankee owner George Steinbrenner has won TV Guide's Mr. Nice Guy Award. He edged out <laughs> Rosie Ruiz from the uh, New York Marathon and also the uh, Olympic Committee for the Lake Placid Games, which stranded everybody out in the cold without transportation. So congratulations to George Stein. Probably means you'll get another commercial out of it or Maybe something. Maybe so. Okay. It's his finest year yeah. ever. <laughs> Thank you, Fred. Now back to you, Don.
Well, I know how you folks are so fond of uh, <clears throat> beauty pageants, so I'm sure you'll stand by for this one. Occasionally, you will see a beauty pageant for a very limited number of contestants. Well, in Houston, some Texans uh, held an unusual contest to pick an unusual beauty. Van Hackett has more on that. It's certain that people don't understand any better than here in Texas, and to prove it, they turned out in droves for Houston's first live armadillo beauty contest, featuring five of the comeliest members of the species possible. Amy Armadillo, Natalie Nacogdoches, Susie Sweetwater, Be My Valentine, and Connie Cut and Shoot all vied for ultimate honors in evening gown and swimsuit competition. It was a tough decision for the judges. I didn't like the way Natalie's suit fit. But finally, a winner was announced. Ladies and gentlemen, our winner is Connie Cuttenshoe! Connie Cuttenshoe! Connie Cuttenshoe, a young lady who likes to read poetry while she listens to Willie Nelson. All that was lacking was Bert Park singing There She Is. But there still were tears in the winner's eyes. And why not? Not only did she earn a night on the town in her own gold limousine with a giant armadillo, but she also gets a four-year scholarship to the University of Texas. For Cable News Network, Van Hackett, Houston. How come the cutest one never wins? It's always comes in second or something. Anyway, one state takes action to zap the double nickel speed limit. We'll have that story when we come back. The court-martial of Robert Garwood is expected to go to the jury tomorrow. The 34-year-old ex-Marine private is accused of collaboration with the enemy in North Vietnam. Eight former POWs testified that they saw Garwood carrying a weapon, wearing a communist uniform, and acting as a guard and interrogator. The defense does not quarrel with the facts, but is contending that Garwood was driven insane by his captors and therefore cannot be held responsible for what he did. If he's found guilty, though, he could get life in prison. There's been a lot of talk about the Reagan administration possibly dropping the federal speed limit of 55 miles an hour and leaving the speed limits up to the various states. If that happens, Oklahoma will be ready, maybe. At least they have the jump on the half dozen or so other states who've talked about increasing the speed limit. Tonight, the Oklahoma State Senate voted to repeal the 55 mile an hour speed limit. But the Oklahoma House must first approve, and then the government, or rather the governor, and then, of course, the Congress. A word on how fast the state senators want to allow their fellow Sooners to go. Penicillin has been saving lives for many years now, but it has also been threatening the lives of those who suffer reactions to that drug. There may be some help for those penicillin allergies. Medical correspondent Jerry Liddell has the details. As many as 25 million Americans react to penicillin because they have or they develop antibodies against the drug. The reactions may vary. 85 to 90 percent of them have minor reactions like hives. The other 5 to 10 percent or so may react with loss of blood pressure, swelling of the throat tissue, or spasms in the airwaves, all reactions that can kill. And these reactions may show up any time in your life or mine. There's quite a bit of work going on to make this wonder drug even safer. Treatment, of course, is always weighed against the risks involved, but for many infections, penicillin is the only way out. One protection that has been developed is skin testing, allergy tests that tell a doctor or a nurse in minutes whether the patient has a penicillin reaction, whether those possibly fatal antibody reactions are there. It works like a normal allergy test. Swelling will indicate the patient is allergic to the drug. Now, there are two testing products on the market, but neither is 100% fail-safe. As many as 10% of the people who are allergic do not show up that way on the testing. There is a third product that has a better track record, but it, as yet, has not the approval of the FDA after a dozen years of testing. There is a major effort cranking up in some corners of the medical community to push the FDA harder to get that product out. Today, very few doctors use any penicillin skin testing. There are also studies which suggest if these skin tests are not done, the safest way to administer penicillin is orally, at least at first. We've given penicillin by mouth to about 50 patients. There are 31 of them we've treated exactly the same way. And we've been able to give the drug in full doses after a few hours of building up to all of these patients without serious allergic reactions. So we've been very encouraged that it's possible to bypass these potentially fatal reactions. Uh, the limits of this we don't know yet. 
Dr. Sullivan and others are experimenting with ways to overcome penicillin reaction for those patients who need the drug. There's been some success with giving the drug in tiny doses at first, increasing slowly, always with medical people present. The experimentation right now is divided among those who favor giving the drug orally and those who favor injections. For the 25 million penicillin allergic Americans, this is a story to watch. Jerry Liddell, Cable News Network in Dallas. News from Medicine is brought to you by new Extra Strength Excedrin. Nothing works harder on your headache. Absolutely nothing. Well, the folks in Greenwich, Connecticut really couldn't care less about the early morning addicts of Punxsutawney Phil, that skittish groundhog. They wanted rain to ease the drought, and today they got it at last. Joanne Lee has the story. Rain, a truly welcome sight. Like many communities in the Northeast, Greenwich, Connecticut has been on notice to conserve water since last summer. But conservation efforts have not been sufficient to offset the shortage. Now the problem has become acute, and the town's 60,000 residents have been placed on a strict rationing plan. Some businesses have even cut back the number of workdays. The corporations are being asked to cut back 60% of their use. Uh, most of those corporations are office buildings. The allowance per person is 45 gallons per day. How far are you from calling a health emergency at this point? That's difficult to say because the water company and the state agencies and the health department haven't agreed on the exact time. But you can't wait until the reservoirs are absolutely empty. So it will be one figure that is used is 8% of when they reach 8% percent of capacity. We're a little over, we're between 12 and 13 percent now. This is one of four reservoirs which serve the town of Greenwich. When this reservoir is full, the water level reaches all the way to the bank. Right now there's less than three inches of runoff water and that's how bad the problem has become. Area reservoirs are down to 444 million gallons of their three and a half billion capacity. Even with rationing, it's estimated that only a 19-day water supply remains. The water company involved blamed the weather. The cause is really four major factors. Number one, uh, it was really the second hottest, uh, third hottest summer on record. It was the driest summer on record. And then that's through August, and then uh, we had extremely warm weather into September and through the middle of September, 95 or better degree weather. The weather was beautiful right on into early part of November, giving us five summer months rather than two and a half or three that we normally run. The town hasn't seen rain like this since November. One inch is expected to fall, but even with this much hope for rain, it would take nine more inches of it to bring water supplies back to normal levels. Joanne Lee, Cable News Network, Greenwich, Connecticut. Well, they are getting a bit now, Dallas, but uh, they're getting a little more than rain up there as well. That's well, some fun. snow's coming in now, Don, in behind it, but uh, boy, they really needed the rain. I was glad to see it for them. The uh, very cold Arctic air has moved all the way down into Florida now. They had some severe thunderstorm watches out earlier today in uh, southern Florida, but all of those have been canceled now, and uh, skies are clearing up a little bit. Let's take a look at the West Coast because uh, things kind of quiet out there after a while. Remember all last week they had all the storminess? Well, high pressure has again established itself over the western part of the nation. Only a few high clouds can be seen today uh, covering southern California back up into Nevada. Temperatures again this afternoon were in the 60s and 70s across southern California, and some sunshine too up the northwest coast temperatures generally in the 40s high pressure